I feel very fortunate that in the early 1980s, I had the chance that, wouldn't you love it if you had the chance to get involved in a major implementation of something you thought was important and to make a fairly substantial and abrupt change to the way things were done. I had that chance, as I'll explain in a moment. And here I am, half a lifetime later, a third of a century later, because of this conference, being given the opportunity to reflect and think, was the effort worth it? Did it make any difference? So this is an attempt to see if a sizeable effort at national change, did it actually turn out in the long run to make much of a difference? It's not in the way of a scientific experiment because it wasn't set up as such, all sorts of variables not controlled for, but there are some statistics, there are some numbers, and there are things I think that I can look at to show you whether what we've been talking about this week in swim and survive methodology, whether if you get a chance to put that into practice, will it make a difference? Um, the presentation by Kevin Moran on the first afternoon ended up by listing 15 competencies. When I hastily went back and looked at what we did in the early 80s and checked against that list, I think we covered all 15 of those competencies, with the exception that we didn't have enough open water swimming experience that I would like to have thrown into the mix. So I'll tell you how it came about. I'll try to examine as best we can in an uncontrolled scientific experiment as to whether it worked. And finally, I would like to mention to you my reflections of the last few weeks of one or two of the lessons that came out. And I know I'm speaking to very influential people and I'm hoping that you get the chance, some moment of opportunity in your agencies that you can influence change. And I'm going to suggest that you really go for it. Okay. Australia. Eight states and territories. Seven of them you can pick out from the map and a tiny little one around the national capital in Canberra, the Australian Capital Territory. Bear in mind that number eight that covers all of our states and territories. I'll come back to that number. The population distribution, that map, one dot represents a thousand people. We don't have a lot of people. Um, they're scattered fairly close to the coast and mainly the east and southeast coast. Two particular moments in time I'm interested in. In the early 80s, our population was 15 million. By year 2000, it was 19.2 million. So that gives you an idea of scale. What was our motivation for wanting to change the situation that we found ourselves in in 1980? From 1920, the Australian government officially kept statistics of drowning. Various shapes and forms and inclusions of various categories. That's about the best effort that I've found for a consistent measure. That's non-boating drownings from 1920 to 1980 in five-year blocks. The point of putting that slide up is to show that there was a fairly solid 500 odd people a year in non-boating drownings. When you added those categories in, it was about 600 people a year, right from 1920 through to the 1980 period that I'm interested in. Um, they are, the, the 2,500 on the side is the total for five years, so divide that by five to give you the 500. Obviously, the dark bars, the males, always lead the females in the totals. In 1980, if you can picture the situation, I don't know how it would relate to your home country, but we had various organisations that had something to do with swimming, something to do with life saving, something to do with rescue. The important ones for my story, the Royal Life Saving Society Australia, which was mainly concerned with an education approach, trying to teach 
mainly young people, but trying to teach bystanders to be able to rescue if they came across unexpectedly a situation where someone was in trouble. Surf Life Saving Australia was interested in competition on the beaches and lifeguarding of surf beaches. The organisations had been won until the 1930s and they split along those lines in the 1930s with surf taking over legally um, the patrolling of beaches and that associated competition. The Amateur Swimming Union of Australia was solely concerned with competitive swimming, peaking with selecting an Olympic team. The clubs also did some learn to swim as feeders into the competitive swim squad, although they were not the main providers of learn to swim. State education departments in those eight states and territories control what happens, and I'm particularly interested in what happened in primary schools, because that's where you would hope that the swimming began and got to some decent level. Whether it did or not is another issue. There were only a few, but there were a few commercially based swim schools where people of means would take their children and pay to have them taught to swim. The typical learn to swim awards in that era, and most parents stopped after the first one when their kid got the first certificate that came home to said that their child could swim, they were happy. And that was about the 25 yards, 25 metres, depending. But that was the starting point, and in many cases the finishing point for learn to swim. Quite often, a newspaper like the Herald Sun in Melbourne, the Advertiser in South Australia or whatever, got their names on the certificates as promoting that campaign. In some states, they were run by the Education Department during the summer vacation. In other states, they were term time. Sometimes it was a different body like the Department of Sport and Recreation in New South Wales. If the kids were keen and the parents were supportive, they went on to future certificates, which were all based on the recognised competitive swim strokes and maybe side stroke thrown in there as well and you gradually got to increase the distances and increase the number of strokes that you could do. But, and maybe a dive entry, maybe a staying alive for 60 seconds or 30 seconds in the deep end um, got added at higher levels but it was that very, very strong emphasis on stroke technique and the distance you could do with that technique. So that was the situation. There were a happy series of coincidences, at least I think they're happy, the people of the general public of Australia didn't at the time, but around that time leading up to 1980, some things were happening. Australia takes the Olympics very, very seriously. The nation stops and glued to the television to watch what happens in sports that they instantly become an armchair expert in once every four years. They might not see that sport at any other time, but they'll stay glued to see how the various countries are going, and particularly if there's any Australian athletes are in there. We take it enormously seriously. Enormous amount of newspaper space, crowds out temporarily, the local football, and so on. Australia did fairly badly in 1972, and the decline really continued in 1976 at the Montreal Olympics, horror of horrors, we didn't win a single gold medal. Got a bronze in swimming, but it's about the first and only time at Olympic Games that Australia hasn't won a gold in swimming. It's usually our biggest producer of Olympic medals, the swimming sport. So people take swimming seriously once every four years, or maybe every second year if you take into account the Commonwealth Games from the old British Commonwealth. Because of that poor performance, it prompted the government, with public support, for the first time ever to start putting a little bit of money towards sport. They paid the salary of a national executive director to get the sport organised, instead of being purely amateur. Twelve months after that, they would pay for a national coaching director or technical director. Both life-saving organisations were smart enough to hook onto that bandwagon, even though they weren't strictly Olympic sports, and so 
they got government money to employ a full-time person um, in those capacities. My involvement there was I was the first national coaching director for Australian swimming for 12 months and then jumped ship across to the Royal Life Saving Society as their first national technical director. So I had the competitive background, but then moved into life saving. Always been interested in it, and had done the various life saving awards as a as a young person. Education departments. This is why I said to remember that number eight. There were really only eight people that needed to be convinced, one in each state and territory, to make things happen for the curriculum at primary schools and particularly in regard to what was done in the way of teaching swimming and the content of it. So it was the last of an era where it was possible by convincing a small number of people to make nationwide change in what happened in Learn to Swim. A lot of those schools used Royal Life Saving Society awards as the basis for what they taught. But the Royal Life Saving Society awards at that stage were mainly rescue of other people the classic bronze medallion and a few lead up awards to that and a few more serious ones beyond that. The Royal Life Saving Society instructional manual was also up for revision. So that was the job I got, revise the manual, revise the award scheme um, for a new era. Now it wasn't just me, there were movements in some of the other states where physical educators were always wanting to teach Learn to Swim in the way we've been talking about this week and for some time. More than just the strokes. Bringing in survival, bringing in all sorts of elements. So, the end product for me was a book which had to be done by December 1982 because that's when the Australian government stopped subsidising the production of educational um, textbooks. So it was done by about December the 22nd, 1982. And I took a little bit of a gamble when they said, how many should you print? Because it was the first time it was in colour and so thick. I said, oh, I'll do 100,000. And that was a bit of a lot. They looked sideways. But the company that printed them as its sponsorship to Life Saving was willing to print them at their cost and only get paid as we took delivery and sold them. So we printed 100,000 with our heart in our mouth. The new thing about that book from what I want to talk about today, forget the changes we made to rescue and the first ever introduction of lifeguarding as well as life saving. I want to talk about swim and survive because they'd never been really involved in the learn to swim end of the, uh, of the sequence. So we came up with a sequence for primary school aged children. In my head it was the five to twelve year olds. It embodied all of the things that we've been talking about, the competencies of day one of this conference. So there was water confidence, there were water safety activities of a whole variety of nature developed in a sequence. Survival swimming, so clothing was introduced um, first with shorts and t-shirt and in the highest level of it, fully clothed boots and socks. Swimming techniques, still important. After all, I'm an old swim coach. I, I want to see efficient movement of the strokes. And I think that efficiency of how you swim breaststroke or side stroke or freestyle is just as important to the learner trying to do the first lap as it is to the competitive swimmer trying to win a race or someone just diving in to swim somewhere for recreation and fun. That economy of movement, efficiency of movement, is what makes it enjoyable, but also what makes it protective of your life, but also makes you win a race. So I, I like technique to be efficient. And then we're developing endurance as we go up the system. So that was the awards. So it's an integrated approach. The second point on that slide, I wanted the assessment to be continuous. The previous tradition was the head teacher in the swim school or the Royal Life Qualified Examiner came in and inspected people as to whether they could do all these things. Now I wanted a whole heap of things to be done, therefore the only practicality was to tick them off as you went through your normal teaching progress of lessons. Um, that was a shock 
to Royal Life Saving Society people to let go of that examining mentality and to trust teachers to be teachers and assessors simultaneously. Simultaneously, the Ostswim organisation was born, a cooperative of all of the swimming bodies with the aim of preparing and certifying teachers of swimming. Now, seven levels over seven years of primary school. Uh, you can see the details of those later or if you're interested, have a look. The philosophy behind it was that if we look at our drowning, whoops, need to go on one more, sorry. Look at, this is the situation at the start of this. Uh, absolutely horrible naught to five year old drowning toll. Nothing to do with what we're talking about here because teaching primary school kids to swim obviously has nothing to do with that. That was an issue of trying to get states to legislate for uh, swimming pool fences of appropriate standard and ways of tackling that. We did make big progress but nothing to do with this. So what I'm worried about is the 20 to 24 year age group, they are the peak of drownings other than the very young child. Very hard to get at those people directly. To change their skills, to change their attitudes, I believe you needed to tackle it in the primary school years with the aim of protecting them 10 or 15 years later. So you have to be patient before you see the results of your effort. So we have these seven levels for the primary school years, although they may be done in high school if the primary kids miss out, comprehensive and integrated, and it requires the teachers to be involved in the assessing as well as the teaching. Now, the implementation strategy. I mentioned we target one person that has the say-so over swimming program assessment in each state, so we did that and had pretty fair success. The Northern Territory, a smaller one, actually let me one year prior to producing the book to shut down all of their existing certificates and try out the Royal Life ones for a year with all school children in the Northern Territory, which they did, pointed out some flaws and defects which we then tried to correct. Ostswim was quite happy and found that our sequence was compatible with what their idea of what should be taught in Learn to Swim, so it was then married in with the preparation of teachers of Learn to Swim. ACHPA was the professional body for phys ed teachers they at the time were running a program trying to get daily physical education into Australia and produced a big thick book with lesson plans for every sort of activity, including swimming, at all levels of primary school. So they chucked our stuff in as their swimming curriculum. So that was good. Assessment by the teacher I've mentioned. Tried to encourage the swim clubs that were competitive in orientation to introduce it as part of their Learn to Swim. Some success, but not as much as I would have liked. So, the important bit. We produced the book, sorry, printed 100,000. That 100,000 sold out within the first season. And they did another 20,000 to get them through the first season. So, it had unexpectedly big sale. Therefore, hundreds of thousands of awards and certificates. Big financial bonanza to each state royal life. None of it came back to national. But it gave the state royal life a chance to do all sorts of other niche programs. So that kind of influences the experiment, but it was good for that sort of stuff. It's not the blanket coverage of Iceland or Monaco and so on that I've been hearing about this week. But I think that about half at least of primary school children got to undertake this scheme at least in its first four or five levels. So, quickly looking at what's, uh, what happened. Um, ignore the two bars on the left. There was big progress on the very young kids because of pool fencing largely. But it's the improvement from the blue to the red bars early on in the age groups that I'm really interested in. So I'll chop off the ends of that graph so that we can now concentrate uh, expand the scale up a bit. These are the number of drownings in the age groups after 20 years so of, the, of the book being released. So it's 15 years about after the first primary school child would have graduated from primary school having had a chance maybe to do the swim and survive sequence. 
So the green line represents the oldest child that would have done that stuff at primary school. And so you can see the red bars have dropped very significantly in 5 to 9, 10 to 14, 15 to 19, and 20 to 25. After that, they're too old to have done that stuff at primary school, and you can see the red and blue bars don't really change much. So I take that, that correlation there as a little bit of a hint that the stuff is making a difference as it works through the age groups. So we're teaching at primary to influence young adults. See the 25 to 29s haven't moved, but if we zip on uh, to now, the most recent data I get is 2000, up to 2014. So now we can see that the 30 to 34 age group, the green line still represents the oldest that could have experienced that program at primary school. That graph has started to move between 2000 and 2014. And all sorts of bumpy things are happening afterwards. So I've just about run out of time. So inside that circle, over the, th the three snapshot points, at the beginning, after 15 years of graduation, and then the most recent, you can see that in the age groups we're concerned, I believe that that program, and other factors too perhaps, but that program probably has an effect um, on what's happened. So you can do the same thing with rates per 100,000, which would need it to be for a scientific paper, but we won't worry about those. The last thing I want to say for my reflections about this, and this is what I would suggest to those of you who get a chance to have an influence on what's done in your organisation, grab any moment that is presented to you to influence the content, and if it's for widespread adoption, and if it's by centralised authorities, which no longer exist in Australia, it's every school for itself, and we're heading in a downhill situation, um, take it. The second thing I'd say is there's a 10 or 15 year gap between this idea of educating at primary to affect the young adult. And that applies in a lot of educational issues, whether it's preparing for a profession or a career or work, we do it. And I'd also say awareness programs are not enough. You need to develop the skills that you think are important. Actually the skills, not just awareness of where a danger might be. And my final comment, as an ex-teacher, um, not the good 10% that Bob talked about, but the other 90% of teachers tend to teach to what the exam is going to be. So if you want something taught, include it in the assessment. And I reckon that's very important. The more you include the whole spectrum of what's required into the assessment, the more you can be confident that the wide spectrum of teachers will address it in their lessons. Okay, thank you.